I'll fill this big bowl with water. Now it needs something interesting. How about this cup of grease? Dad poured it off our hamburgers at lunch. He won't need it anymore. Yeah, that looks like it. Needs some color. Cranberry juice. Okay, a little more of this. What on earth is that? What? The pink stuff with the big greasy globs. Oh, I'm making gasoline. Gasoline? Martin, children can't make gasoline in a kitchen. Now please empty that stuff out of the good mixing bowl and clean up the mess. I heard the man on the news, Dad. He said people needed more gasoline, and I'm going No good more to... arguments and no more experiments in this kitchen. Oh, Dad. I'll pour my gasoline into this plastic jar. I have to prove that it works. Everyone will know Martin the inventor. If I could just think how to prove. I think I know. Ricky! Hey, Ricky! Hey, man. You finally have it running? Yeah, nice on, no? It only take me four Saturdays. It's ready to go now. Hey, someday after school, I take you for a ride. I have some extra gas, Ricky. Want me to pour some in? Sure, man. Pour it in here. And tell your dad, thanks. What kind of juice you give me, boy? I made some gasoline. Guess it doesn't work. Something you made? Pesty kids can't make gasoline. I can't make gasoline. I don't even know anybody who can make gasoline. I wanted to make something important. Yeah, well, if you want to do something important, go get me a cold drink while I fix this mess you made. And your old man better do something important to you when he hears about this. Now what? When I hear about what, Martin? Rick is real mad at me. I gotta take him this drink real fast. Your gasoline? Oh, no. Your mother and I will talk with you about your punishment when she gets home from work. Right now, I'd better make peace with our neighbor. And please, don't get into any more trouble. Boy, I just wanted to help. In other news tonight, economic summit leaders say that a peace plan for the Middle East will help the economy ease tensions both here and abroad. However, oil prices... They're always talking about important things. Oil, wars, peace plans. All I have is a backyard and a bunch of little kids who are always fighting. I'm getting out of here. No way, I've got an idea. Maybe I can get them to stop fighting. Gina, if everyone had a shovel, you could build a mountain in the sandbox. Okay, if I can sit on top first. Hey, Jesse, untie your prisoners and bring your rope over here. I'll show you how to make a real lasso. Oh, boy. You already had your turn. I did not. You did too. Did not. Uh-oh, here comes Martin. Okay, Martin, don't start up on us. We'll give up peacefully. We'll even give you a crack at the ball. Batter up. Throw me a strike. Whoopee! Damn! Rick! This time I really did it! I made something important! A home run? No! Something people need lots more than that! The man on the news is always talking about it! Not more gas, I hope! Nope! It's invisible, but you can feel it inside you and all around you! It wasn't here a few minutes ago, but now it is! Well, tell us! What? I made peace! I can make peace with everyone I meet. Make peace and it can't be beat. It's something I can do and it's real important too. I can make peace, it's true. Well, I can't drive a car or go down the street too far. I can't make gasoline, not that's real I mean. And even though I'm small, I want to do something big, do something so neat. My folks will flip their wigs, and I can make peace with everyone I need. Make peace, and it can't be beat. It's something I can do, and it's real important, too. I can make peace, it's true. My brothers were fighting just the 
other night I said if you love each other this just isn't right And as I talked they began to grin Cause I helped to find a way to be friends again And I can make peace with everyone I meet Make peace and it can't be beat It's something I can do and it's real important too I can make peace, it's true With everyone I meet Make peace and it can't be beat It's something I can do And it's real important too I can make peace, it's true Now what can I do When my day goes wrong And they argue and pout And don't get along Pray on my knees by my bedside That God will give me a love That I just can't hide And I can make peace With everyone I meet I can make peace, it's true. I can make peace with everyone I meet. Make peace and it can't be beat. It's something I can do and it's real important too. I can make peace, it's An elephant family Nyessa the mother A sister Victoria And a brother named Zambezi There was wise old man Yara The elephant granny Congo was the smallest But she had a fantabulous memory I'm Congo the elephant I never forget I'll grow up to be the smartest elephant yet. I remember how to get leaves from the trees and how to talk with the chimpanzees. How to smell a lion on the breeze and make friends with the pygmies. I remember to cover my trunk when I sneeze and when to say thank you, please. I remember my manners to be polite and I never forget to brush my tusks at night. My mother is so proud of me. She remembered her mother telling her brother and sister one day. Congo may be smart, but she still is small, so be gentle when you play. That's the rule of the elephant way. Next day they were all out tromping around Their stomachs making a rumbling sound That means they're glad With swaying trunks and padded feet And big ears flapping a happy beat They were on their way to the lake A drink to get and a bath to take Along the way they had leaves and fruit now and then, they gave their trunks a toot. Hey, wait for me! Come along now, dear. It was fine and hot by the water that day, so they waded in and began to play. <laughs> they squirted and splashed and rolled in the mud and wrestled round neath the golden sun. Then all at once at the lake There was an accident It was a terrible mistake They were all having so much fun But Zambezi forgot That Congo was the smallest one He squirted mud right in her eye And Congo screeched and began to cry Then he pushed her under water She trumpeted and Nyasa hurried to help her little daughter. She lifted Congo to her feet 
and scolded Zambezi. Congo snorted and sniffed and coughed and whiffed and was as mad as she could be. You could have drowned me in this pool. Sorry, guess I forgot the room. But Congo yelled. Well, I have a super memory and I'll never forget what you did to me, Zambezi. For all the rest of that day, Congo refused to play. <laughs> and though the other elephants still had fun, Congo stayed away. Days passed by and Congo found it hard to eat. She was so upset that even fruit didn't taste very sweet. Yup, chewy! Zambezi and Victoria would invite Congo to play. Congo! But Congo would say, I have a super memory and I never forget! And then she'd walk away. Aww. Well, wise old grandmother Manyara had been watching, so she called together the elephant family. She said, the family is not happy. Zambezi and Victoria are both lonely. And Congo doesn't eat or play. She seems quite sick, I would say. But Congo said, I'm not sick at all, you see. I just can't forget what Zambezi did to me. I still remember that day at the lake. Super memory. You've got a very good memory, my dear, but you've forgotten an important thing. It is clear. What's that, Granny? You've forgotten to forgive, and that's important to happily live. Remember what's important. Forgive and forget. Forget and forgive. Then she nudged Congo towards Zambezi. Their trunks reached out and touched. And they gave each other a squeeze. <laughs> then Minyara gave a trumpet call. <laughs> and they were off again to the lake. A drink to get and a bath to take. Congo walked with Zambezi. And they both felt extraordinarily happy. <laughs> it was a rainy gray morning, and Mr. James forgot to kiss Mrs. James goodbye when he left for the office. Mrs. James felt quite cross because of this, and because the rain made the day so gray. So when Jonathan James came down for breakfast, she was sharp with him. Oh, for goodness sakes, why did you wear that shirt again today? It's filthy. Well, the, the shirt looked clean to Jonathan, and he thought her unfair. Because of this, and because the rain made the day so gray, he turned on Sally James when she came down for breakfast. Can't you ever get down in time? You'll be late to school for sure. The clock said 8.15, which was the time Sally was supposed to come down, and she thought Jonathan was completely unreasonable. Because of this, and because the rain made the day so gray, when Sally got to school and met her best friend Marjorie in the hall, she looked at her and said, Ha! Where'd you get that awful raincoat? It looks like a boy's. Marjorie, who thought the raincoat was a beautiful shade of yellow, felt Sally was very unpleasant. And because of this, and because the rain made the day so gray anyway, when she got home from school and found her little brother playing with her dolls, she said, Why do I have a sissy for a brother? Eddie, her little brother, always played with her dolls. And she had never minded before, and he thought her most unkind. Because of this, and because he couldn't go outdoors to play in the rain, Eddie went to his room and shoved the dog off his bed where the dog was sleeping. But the dog didn't mind the rain. 
she thought Eddie was playing, so she put her front paws down on Eddie's chest and began licking his face. <laughs> <laughs> this tickle that made him laugh, and he was laughing so hard that when Marjorie came in looking for a pencil for her arithmetic homework, <laughs> he gave her his best one with a new eraser. <laughs> She was so grateful she couldn't help smiling and saying, Thank you very much. She started out of the room and then turned back. You really aren't a sissy. She couldn't find the paper she would copied the problems on, and she had to call up Sally to get them. She forgot she was mad at her. Hello, Sally. And she sounded so friendly that Sally was sorry she had said that about the raincoat. She gave Marjorie the homework and said, It's really not so bad, that raincoat. You just have to get used to the color. Then she hung up feeling better and ran back upstairs humming to herself. <laughs> she met Jonathan at the top of the staircase. Hi there, Johnny, she said. I wasn't late at all. And she smiled at him so pleasantly that Jonathan said, <laughs> I was just teasing you. It's okay, said Sally. Just then, Mrs. James came into the hall. Jonathan said, I'll put this in the laundry tonight for sure, Mom. And Mrs. James was so pleased that he remembered, she said, All right, dear. I couldn't have hung the wash in all this rain anyhow. Tomorrow will do as well. Around five o'clock, the sun came out. Everything looked glistening and clean and the birds began to sing just as Mr. James came home and gave Mrs. James a great warm hello kiss. Then they all went upstairs to wash for dinner. The dusty red road led down, down to the river. The thirsty cattle knew their way down, for they came this way every day for water and fresh green grass. Makoka and Wanga followed their father's cows under the hot African sun. I hope the brothers from across the bridge will not be at the river today, Wanga said. If they're not around, we can go swimming, Makoka said, hopefully. Makoka and Wanga liked to swim in the river, but they were very careful, for sometimes Otaha and his brothers appeared on the other side of the river. They taunted Makoka and Wanga, threw stones at them, and tried to hit them with sticks. Wanga's eyes flashed. Otaha is the meanest boy I know. If I were big enough, I would fight him. I would teach him a lesson. Perhaps some day you will, said Makoka. These people have been like enemies to us since our grandfathers fought with Otaha's grandfathers. Wanga! Makoka shouted as he started to run. The cows are too far ahead of us. Some of the cows were already heading toward the bridge instead of the path toward the river. Listen! Wanga cried. Both boys heard the faint sound of a truck on the road behind them. Hurry, Wanga! We must get the cattle off the road! As Makoka and Wanga raced after the cows, the truck appeared. It sped toward them, raising a large cloud of red dust behind it. Makoka ran to one side of the road, and Wanga ran to the other. They got all but three of the cows safely off the road. These three strays trotted onto the bridge. The truck rushed past the boys and raced toward the bridge. The cows were so startled that they ran onto the land across the bridge, land used by Otaha's people. As the truck sped from sight, Makoka and Wanga looked at each other with fear in their eyes. Neither felt brave enough to go after the three cows, and both were afraid to return home without them. While the boys were trying to decide what to do, Otaha and his three brothers came out of the bush across the river. Pointing at the cows and at Makoka and Wanga, Otaha laughed. 
left. The four boys picked up sticks. They began running after the cows, beating them and scattering them as far apart as possible. They were laughing. Makoka and Wonga could only watch as their cows were driven away. They listened to the taunting shouts and laughter of Otaha's brothers. So from deep inside, anger began rising. Anger filled both boys from their toes up to their heads and filled their thoughts. After the cows had been chased deep into the bush, Otaha shouted, Come, let's go swimming! Soon the sound of laughter and splashing water told Makoka and Wanga that they could now cross the bridge in safety. The boys worked a long time to round up the three frightened cows and walk them back across the bridge. They were tired and hot and still angry. They could still hear the shouts of Otaha and his brothers as they played and swam in the river just around the bend. Come, it's time to go home, called Otaha. A few minutes later, they heard Otaha calling again. This time his voice sounded farther away. He was calling his younger brother to come home. In a little while, answered the younger brother. It's our turn now, Makoka said, jumping up. The brothers walked to the bend in the river. They stopped as they saw that Otaha's younger brother was jumping up and down in water that almost covered his head. All at once, he appeared to lose his footing and began to swim, but the current was too strong for him, and he was being swept out into deeper, faster water. Makoka and Wanga watched, alarmed. The boy struggled to get back to calmer water. His head went under. When he came up, he shouted for his brother, but Otaha was too far away to hear. Makoka suddenly dashed down the river bank and into the water. A strong swimmer, he swam straight toward the drowning boy and grabbed him under the chin. With sturdy strokes, Makoka swam toward the opposite bank. When he could touch the bottom with his feet, he lifted the boy in his arms, carried him out of the water, and laid him gently on the bank. The young boy gradually regained his strength and struggled to his feet. He looked with amazement into the face of Makoka. He started to say something, but then he turned and walked slowly up the path to his village. Without moving, Makoka watched him go. The anger that had burned in him all day was gone. He knelt down and picked up a smooth stone and tossed it in the river. The ring made by the splash grew larger and larger until it reached the two sides of the river. Makoka rose to his feet. He was bone tired, but as he walked up the path leading home, he felt only a great peace. It's hard to love our enemies. It's hard to love our enemies. Like the Bible tells us to. Like the Bible tells us to. It's hard to love another. It's hard to love another. When it's not returned to you. When it's not returned to you. Jesus says to try it. But Jesus says to try it. We'll feel better if we do. We'll feel better if we do. Love each other as he taught. Love each other as he taught. Let your love shine through. If you get in a scuff, if you get in a scuff, and someone treats you rough, and someone treats you rough. Want to hurt them too, and you want to hurt them too, cause they were mean to you, cause they were mean to you. To turn the other cheek, to turn the other cheek, doesn't mean you're weak, doesn't mean you're weak. It's the better thing to do, it's the better thing to do. So let your love shine through. A different point of view, with a different point of view, or another color of skin, or another color of skin. Just treat them like a friend, just treat them like a friend. Cause if and when you do, cause if and when you do, you'll find out it's true, you'll find out it's true. The 
Jesus works through you. Jesus works through you. When you let your love shine through. Most every night by nine o'clock, the lights were out in the windows of the houses in Purchase, New York. One stormy October night, however, the window panes at the kitchen end of the one little house glowed cheerfully through the rain long after the rest were dark. Here lived an elderly woman, Sarah Haynes, quite alone. Each evening it was Sarah's custom to settle herself into the rocking chair beside the cozy wood stove. During the day, she was liable to be interrupted because everyone in the village knew her and loved to stop for a chat. But now, all purchase was asleep, and Sarah could devote this time to reading a few chapters of the Bible. It was not until ten that she closed her book. She was taking off her spectacles when a heavy thump sounded at the door. Sarah laid her spectacles on the Bible and rose briskly. Before she could reach the door, the thump came again. She turned the knob, and a man staggered into the room. She caught at his arm, her face all wrinkled with concern. Dear me! Oh, dear me, poor man! What ails thee? Such a night to be out, and thy clothes are soaking! With some difficulty, Sarah pushed the door shut against the wind. The man glanced around the room. He did not speak. Take thy coat right off and hang it over the chair by the stove. I will have a blaze in a moment. The stove is already warm. Put thy feet there. Dear me, poor man. Thee has walked some distance. Ten miles, the man muttered. Ten miles? And in this storm? May I not dry thy coat? The man shook his head. No. Not much under it. Sarah thought for a moment. Would thee mind slipping on a coat of my dear husband's? I keep it always hanging in the hall closet, though he has not been with me for fifteen years. She darted through the doorway, and a light flickered in the hall. The instant she was gone, the man sprang to the corner cupboard. A silver tea set shone behind the glass doors. He hesitated, his hand on the knob, when the gentle voice spoke from the doorway. Do excuse me, friend. In my haste to get thee dry clothing, I forgot entirely that thee might be hungry. I do not keep food in that cupboard, but while thee is there, will thee please hand down a willow plate from the second shelf? Would thee care for bacon and eggs? They are in the shed. When Sarah bustled back again, she found the man seated at the table near the stove. As she set a sizzling platter of bacon with two fried eggs before him, he kept his face turned away from her and remained silent. Did thee change thy coat for my husband's? The coffee is slow in boiling, but will soon be ready. I will get thee a taste of my fresh quince jelly from the cellar. When Sarah was halfway down the cellar stairs, she heard the man say, as though to himself, No, I can't wear your husband's coat. He was a good man. He ate, and did not turn again to look at the silver tea set. When the meal was over, Sarah pointed to the sofa with its blue coverlet. It is late to go out into the storm again tonight. Thee is welcome to sleep here, and take breakfast before they leaves. The next morning, the
The man was sleeping heavily and did not waken until Sarah shook him by the arm, saying, The mush is ready. At the table, the man cleared his throat and asked, Would there be any farmers of purchase who might need the help of a strong pair of hands? I will send thee to my brother, said Sarah. Oft times he has work for a hired hand on his farm. As the man left the kitchen, he turned and said, I knew you lived alone, and I came last night to steal your silver. But something about you made me change my mind. Sarah smiled. No, it was Jesus Christ who changed thy mind. Well, maybe so, answered the man. But he was certainly speaking through you. Sarah stood quietly as the man walked away. I can do and it's real important too I can make peace 